All right. So um, this is a telecom music group, and this call is being recorded, um, the meeting, and they are posted to YouTube. So if you're presenting anything or speaking, then it will be um, presented on public forum. The meetings meet uh, monthly, the first Monday, and the time switch um, this is the later time, 1500 UTC. The next meeting will be at 1100 UTC. All right. The topics are open. If anyone has anything, um, feel free to add, or you can say something now if, if there's an item that you want to discuss. I, I do think that a lot of the discussions that have been happening in the CNF working group well, channel in Slack, there's quite a few of them that we could probably bring into the tag to focus on. Um, for the telecom user group is, is meant to be a place where we can have a, a more open discussion about any type of concerns or ideas that are um, related in the telecom domain. And um, as people are coming in and looking at new technology within, I'd say the CNCF ecosystem, so cloud native ecosystem and community across the board. So that's a bit broader than the CNF working group, which has a, a more uh, narrow focus. Um, so if anyone had any of the things, I mean, I see Tal and um, some other people that have been presenting and talking quite a bit um, in the um, many areas, but if y'all have any topics that we haven't got to on the CNF working group where it's been kind of to the side, then please speak up or we can add them to a future tag as well. Right. Uh, so the right now the CNF working group is weekly um, and that means it's right after this call. We may do some adjustments so they're not back to back like that um, going forward. Right now we're looking at having a CNF working group today and it's likely to be next week. There may be a gap with holidays and then starting up again. The TUG meeting, the next Telco Music Group meeting is on the 4th of January, and we um, currently plan to have that. That'll be the 1100 UTC. Uh, there's a Elephant Developer and Testing Forum where there may be a track uh, with CNCF telecom related activities. So there could be stuff related to the tag, the CNF working group, potentially the CNF test bed and the CNF test suite will be on that track. We're still trying to work out the details. Um, that's in February. And uh, KubeCon, uh, Cloud Native Con Europe, CFPs um, will be closing on Sunday, December 13th. So we got a, a week if you're gonna get something in, Just putting that out. And there's been more and more talk on topics. So um, please get stuff in there. And um, so the Kubernetes cloud native community will um, get more and more engaged directly. All right, Bill, do you wanna talk about uh, the white paper? And I can hand it to you. I'll stop screen sharing for a minute. Sure. Um, so for some reason, my internet connect connection is slightly unstable today. Um, but in case anybody wasn't aware, the white, the first white paper um, that we were working on in the telecom user group is now 
uh, been published um, and you can find it in the GitHub repo. I can add a link, uh, uh, the link's already in there. Um, so if you want to use this to go out and talk about uh, cloud native, please feel free to use this as a reference point um, going forwards. And I, I think it's a great first step for this group and I look forward to seeing um, more white papers um, coming out of this group. Um, and kind of with that, I, I think that's a good transition to uh, Jeffrey Salins um, to talk about maybe the, the next white paper to come out of this group. So Jeffrey, do you want to take it? Yep, sure. Let's see here. Can you guys see my browser? Looks good. It's okay. a small. Small? One sec. Not the same. Better? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so first I'm gonna throw out a disclaimer. I started this 18 months ago and in our space things move pretty fast. Um, so just bear with me here, but the, um, the initial audience for the white paper that Bill was just referencing was really um, around like that kind of like CTO, senior architect level, right? Like um, there was some discussions in the CNF working group about talking about motivations and like why cloud native. And I think that that um, first white paper was kind of trying to achieve some of that of just a generic, why would we, you know, do cloud native in the first place? And to me, like the general motivation, I think is kind of covered in, um, if we kind of take off the niche use case hat for a second and think about like what our enterprise, you know, um, web services look like for how we present our stuff to customers, how we run a lot of our own internal IT clouds in telco and stuff. I would say the vast majority of us, I would be willing to bet. I know Charter is, um, does a ton of cloud native esque software development for things like, um, you know, our online marketplace, things like that. It runs in Kates, it runs in the cloud, et cetera. Um, so this was supposed to kind of be, um, like some of the early discussions I had with other providers, like Mr. Bernier down here, um, some of the vendors like Geargay on the call, et cetera, talking about some of the, um, drivers and challenges for like, why would we do cloud native for the actual like telco and cable workloads? Why would we shove a CMTS into containers? or you know, whatever. Um, why would we do the packet core the way we're starting to move? I mean, the packet core standards themselves are now actually starting to dictate cloud native you know, and cloud centric um, approaches. So like this is creeping into our standards bodies as well um, as we continue to kind of permeate into the cloud native world. So, you know, this is your typical, just generic. This is why we're doing it. It'll need to be updated. Like I said, it's pretty old, but um, you know, the long and short is, is not only do a lot of us think this is a good idea, it's being forced on us, right? Um, vendors also have to do their economy of scale discussions internally, and there's no way that they're gonna be able to support and staff you know, a future where they offer a physical packet core, a virtual packet core, and a cloud native packet core, right? Like they need to focus their efforts. Um, and a lot of our vendors are like, hey, this is the direction we're going. Charter, you need to get ready for it, right? Um, I have these discussions with a lot of the big players pretty regularly. Um, so then really getting down into what pieces should be cloud native, um, like why are we doing this and stuff is kind of like my attempt here. Um, looking at some of the challenges we had with um, NFE and seeing if we can remediate some of those and not carry them forward. I used some of this business speak. I tried to do a little bit of research. Um, but you know, the whole like crossing the chasm and early majority thing, right? Like, at this point, Kates has crossed the chasm. It's used in a lot of places. It's widely adopted. It's kind of like, it's really not even like that chic anymore. Like it's kind of like a safe technology for hosting and orchestrating containers, which that's what the market people, you know, say those of us that are running like real world Kates workloads want to pull our hair out sometimes and, you know, cry in the shower so nobody can see our tears. But um, for the most part though, it's, it's baked into a lot of stuff. One thing though, I don't think that um, this whole diagram that you know shows the little curve going up and across and know your technology is now kind of like widely adopted is um, 
this ecosystem continues to grow and like you're constantly in like this weird spot where like more and more stuff is being added to this extensible platform and you'll have while Kate's itself is established early adopters pulling different technology buckets into it like lots and lots of companies running Kate's not every company that runs Kate's is using a service mesh um, a lot of the optimizations that Tal's covered around like the topology manager, some of the more fancy CNI multiplexers like Multis, Danum, et cetera, like those are out there and we have early adopters that are consuming them and doing cool stuff with them. But um, there's a lot of people who are still scared of it. So like one of the things I'm hoping this group and the CNF working group provides us with the best practices and stuff is, is um, for those that are in the more risk adverse spaces, um, how do we know where something is within the ecosystem as a whole, as far as like its adoption, its stableness, um, you know, like technically V6, like that's a huge, huge thing for all of us service providers is still what in beta status upstream. Um, it's slowly but surely every Kate's release getting more and more mature, but like, you know, sometimes even just the terminology and how CNCF like designates whether something is an alpha, beta or GA um, is different than like the rest of us. like. And so like if one of my executives here is beta, it doesn't matter if it's been in beta for seven years and it's super stable, it's nope, we don't put beta code into our production network, right? So um, trying to change those perceptions. Um, so yeah, some of the like challenges, um, I mean, you have generic telco challenges. Integration is hard, right? We have these giant brownfields. Um, we're constantly putting new greenfield stuff into it. When do we just completely slice off a section of our infrastructure and run it in a vacuum and allow it to eventually grow and consume the old brownfield? When do we need to directly interface with the brownfield? Um, while I think we're doing a lot of cool stuff in the DC space, I don't think any of us are prepared to put like, you know, one of our like core routers in containers yet and in a stack of x86. I know Intel would love for me to do that, <laughs> but I don't think we're quite there yet when we're talking about like something that's got like, you know, 400 gig line rate in this pack and pushing hundreds of millions of packets a second, like tool sprawl. This is another big one. Um, and so once again, to um, Taylor's earlier disclaimer, when I think of the telco user group, I think of us telco users and our vendors who help us um, talking about like generic challenges in the cloud native space. Um, tool sprawl is huge. Um, a lot of times when we have like these different engineering groups, like what I'm at in Charter, um, we're constantly doing like our little R&D phase, doing something cool with like some piece of technology and we're like, hey, operations, you need to deploy this, it's awesome. And it gets to the point where, um, you know, we start having these discussions about an integrated vertical stack of Kate's versus the vendor provided stack, you know, um, Vuk in the, um, I don't know if I pronounced that right, I apologize if I didn't, has put a lot of stuff in like the work that Deutsche Telekom has done around building out their open stack and their Kubernetes environments in them. I would be willing to bet if we had him on the phone right now and maybe he'll be on the next call that tool sprawl is a huge part of this, right? Um, when you present like different interfaces, you put a different wrapper around the Kate's API, you change all the cube cuddle commands to like, you know, OS instead or some Mirantis command or whatever. Um, it's just more and more stuff that operations has to consume. And I think um, a lot of times, you know, people who aren't from like either the provider or the provider vendor side don't track that a lot of times like in the legacy world of service providers, um, operations would hire for like a specific skill set. Like they really know Juno S. And so we can put them in front of all of our Juniper routers and they know that CLI inside and out, or they know iOS XR. They know, um, you know, we've got all this old ALU gear and like this person is like an Alcatel master from before the mergers and stuff. And they're like keeping all this like 20 year old equipment growing for us. Um, so you get like this thing where like operations hits this point where they're just like no more new stuff, right? Like you need to consolidate. And um, this is a tough one in this new space. Um, I think this is one of the hardest challenges because providers can't run 50 different flavors of Kate's and expect operations to consume it. But there also has to be some type of concession to vendors on like, how do they maintain an SLA in a third party stack, a provider stack, or can they get to the point where um, one sec, chat, and please by any means um, step in and interrupt me at any time. I'm just kind of covering some stuff I had because I was asked. I don't know where my chat window is. I moved it to a different screen, so I can't read it. Um, it's just about- Kayla, if you want to read chat and just call it out. Kierke, go ahead. 
Yeah, it's, it's just it's just a math mathematics about the bandwidth dimension. But like, I I think um, one important aspect of of all of this is somehow uh, creating some kind of industry standards or best practices. And here on standards, I mean like really something that is defined in the tag or in the or in the CNS working group. Because there are lots of things. So Kubernetes by default is a pluggable uh, thing. So you can have lots of different flavors of it. And and uh, CNTC, you know, tries to build up this like opinionated distribution, which means that that it somehow um, tries to fix these all these moving parts in the infrastructure. But on top of that, we have still lots of uh, different, like not agreed things. Like I don't know, like best example and most most simplistic example is like resource naming in in Kubernetes. Now we have the situation that every uh, operator requires us a different naming scheme for how to name the resources in 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 our um, pod manifest what we deliver to to them. And that's not, not really optimal from vendor's perspective. And this kind of things, I think we need, we, we, we need lots of these kind of agreements in the industry. Yeah, I agree. Um, I will say, and I'm gonna cover something like down here in the NFE specific stuff, but like, one of the things where I think like CNT has helped, but one of the places I think Gergay that we still need some help is around like um, defined interfaces. Um, like we have the reference architecture and reference implementation, but like there's still enough room like for interpretation where I could set up Kate's wrong and still follow the guide or I could do something that breaks how you interact with it. Um, I'm hoping like the best practices would be something that like supplements the reference architecture. And I mean, I've said this in this channel and the other channel, I don't think we need another reference architecture. We have them, right? Like I know how I can plumb multiple interfaces into something. I know where Kate's goes in the stack. Um, there's plenty of documentation to pull from. I think that next level. And so I'm gonna really quick jump around here. Um, the sole zero zero hash, you know, interfaces in Etsy. Um, this was like something where, I mean, there was a reference architecture that the Etsy Mano group put out early on, right? Like you have your NFEO, your VNFM and your VIM. And like, here's all the main pieces. And the vast majority of us built those. The interaction between those pieces was not well defined. I feel like it's just now finally starting to get caught up, but like there's a lot of ambiguity um, and We've already discussed that like, this isn't a standards body and we're not gonna be able to dictate a bunch of stuff to a whole lot of people. For one, you'll never get Charter, AT&T and Comcast to build the same stack. It'll just never happen, you know? Um, so figuring out like what ambiguity needs to be squashed out because it can't, you know, be covered in an API versus, you know, what is something reasonable that like, you know, a JSON payload or a Tosca model or something would be able to reasonably account for those with some flags to like determine I'm going down path, path X or Y because um, I can just tell you we, we went down this path where you know the the Mano stack the NFEO and VNFM technically they're two separate functions in the reference architecture and every single service provider we wanted to pull those apart we wanted best in class NFEO best in class VNFM you know especially pre ONAP days and um you know, the APIs for SOL 3 and SOL 5 were very, very poorly defined at the time. Um, you know, the, the concept of um, where network creation lives, it gets really, really like political on is the network tied to the life cycle of the VNF? So it's, you know, part of the VNFM. Is it a shared resource in OpenStack VMware, the cloud, wherever? If not, then it goes into the creation of the NFEO. And, you just get into these things. So then when we come and say vendor A, take your NFEO and put it on vendor V's VNFM, um, I can just tell you through personal sleepless nights, um, it's rough. And it's not really the vendor's fault because technically they were building and designing the specifications. The problem is, is those standards and specifications 
left tons and tons of stuff open to interpretation. And so you can't really tell anybody they did anything wrong, but the integration cost effort just made it to where like a lot of us started questioning is NFE even worth it? Yeah, but that, that, that's what we should prevent from happening again, I think. And, the, and yes, I agree that, that big part of that problem was that the source specs were started very late. So for the ones who don't know how these SNF specs are built, the like the source specs are the real specs which are describing the let's say on wire protocol. All, the, all other specs are just you know higher level stuff that you can interpret in a thousand different ways. So we can consider that like the what we would consider as an API specification. Uh, those are the, the source specs and, and it's an indication that only the source specs have, a, have an open API representation. And I'm just giving examples, right? Gergay, like I agree, like the only reason I'm listing these as challenges is because I think that they're things that we could begin to address and fix now. I mean, the Kubernetes API, if you've ever just downloaded the API <laughs> and read through it and get, it is like the most sprawling massive thing on the planet. Um, but, you know, at the same time, we all consume it and we're semi-successful with it, right? So, I mean, like, I know it's possible for us to get this stuff in. And I think this is one of the things where like the CNF working group, I think it's more of that focus is what are the best practices for, you know, pushing something into Kubernetes for consuming it from Kubernetes. And so this goes back to the tool sprawl comment too. And this is something, there's been a lot of lively um, conversation in the CNF working group, but, um, the concept of developing using cloud native principles, a CNF versus putting CNF practices in place as an operator to consume, right? And if the CNF is developed with the interfaces and a good specification, as you're pointing out, Gerge, and I've done my homework as an operator to have the infrastructure and the orchestration in place to consume it appropriately, then some of the you know vendor secret foo can be put in place but still be consumed. Like it gives the vendors a chance to still, you know, maintain, um, you know, their competitive edge, right? Like at the same, one, you guys are developing, you're spending a ton of money on intellectual property, you know, um, research, et cetera. So like, I mean, I know we're in the open source group right now, but not everybody just wants to give away all their money making secrets, right? So like, how do you keep your competitive edge? How do you put some differentiation into your CNFs, but how do I still reasonably run it in my infrastructure without going down the souls one through five in like the you know 2015 ish time frame path because I mean it just it just didn't work plain and simple <laughs> so yeah I mean these are the like and I think big picture stuff this is where why I stay engaged in the tug right is um to talk to other providers to talk to vendors like you know trying to like emulate something that happened with ONAP. ONAP was like this, like 1.5 million line code dump at the beginning. It was all over the place. Things worked, they didn't work. I think one thing though that ONAP can really be seen as a success is how like the conversation amongst those developers eventually evolved into them collaboratively coming up with these kind of best practices that Taylor's described for CNFs. Like, I feel like it kind of slowly happened organically over there where the collaboration and just like the, hey, this is a good idea. This is a bad idea stuff really started to you know, influence that group as a whole for the better. Uh, Jeff, sorry, a couple of comments. Um, yep. Um, Mano is, a, uh, at least the reference implementation is a very <clears throat> tied into the uh, canonical uh, <clears throat> ecosystem and uh, it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to uh, bring it out of it. Uh, my my uh, bigger point is, um, we, you have, we have all these NFE specific uh, things that we require. And uh, uh, <clears throat> I think we need to involve the cloud providers into this effort because today we, we use uh, uh, AVX 512 or SRI or we, and, uh, but we cannot natively use uh, AKS or uh, EKS or uh, Google engine because these, uh, the, the specific requirements that we need, they are not, available directly in this code. So, so we have to um, install our own Kubernetes platform or anything like that and on top of the cloud, even though they provide it and we manage it ourselves. So I think to be truly cloud native, it will be good if we involve the, uh, the cloud providers and uh, uh, 
have these capabilities built into the cloud infrastructure itself. No, I, I agree. I mean, that was actually one of the very first things I sent to Taylor and Bill. Um, and for one, the, these NFE specific, these are not saying things we need. I'm saying these are challenges. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, right, like they some, some of these things we are, we, are, we are facing right now. I mean, uh, we are, we are uh, <clears throat> the CNF vendors. Uh, so we, are, we, are, we have these challenges right now. So yeah, I mean, that was one of my requests. I, I've been trying to bug guys like I'm um, Hawking and a few others at Google. Um, I saw Robbie floating around. I'm hoping Robbie will bring some of the core like AWS guys um, in, but I mean, there's certain vendors that are pitching the idea of running my packet course control plane in a public cloud and then running my user plane on-prem, right? Um, so like, to your point, like I really feel like if we're gonna talk about large scale like architectures, best practices, you know, infrastructure decisions, having both sides of the coin um, are important um, because they look at things differently than we do. Um, and I, one of the things though, is I feel like they also have a common understanding with us though, on like some of the insane regulatory um, restrictions we have in place. Like there's times where like, you know, someone in like one of the CNF, CNCF groups will be like, you know, Jeffrey, why are you so hung up on network segmentation? And I'm like, well, because I have a legal obligation to mm -hmm. do that. Like it's, it's not like within my like design matrix of deciding do I want it or not. So, um, but I mean, like we might get a lot of people from Amazon and Google that tell us we should never do SROV. I don't know, right? I'm like, that's why we want those people there. We want different paradigms. Um, especially in the tug um, versus the CNF working group where we're trying to like give some like real tangible benefits right now and help people like deal with the right now. I really see the tug as like a place for us to be like, where should we be in five years? Um, that's one of the drivers, right? Like yeah. if my architecture in 2025 looks like what it you know, does today, just with different components, then we've probably missed the boat somewhere. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have to keep going through this, you know, um, I know everybody can read this. I'll just say like, we, people can like come in here, add, delete these. I put this in the um, Tugs Google Doc. Um, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Some of this might not be relevant anymore. I mean, the big thing too, and um, I know someone put this in the CNF working group, is um, putting some of those like benefits in some of our best practices, right? Like, um, I'm always harping on the requirements thing, right? But like, I'm obviously here and I spend a lot of time in these groups because I do see the value, right? I want uptime, Kubernetes self heals containers, right? And we got into this discussion and is the uptime tied to the container itself or is it, you know, tied to something else? And in my mind, it's, is my service, you know, reachable? Um, I mean, the whole point of doing replica sets, you know, deployments using self healing, auto scaling, et cetera, is because you're more concerned with like service uptime than you are infrastructure uptime in this space. And I'll be honest, like once again, um, around like the operational folks at my company, that's an interesting conversation for them to have because like in their world, you know, they are infrastructure providers. They provide network infrastructure, server infrastructure, virtualization infrastructure, and their SLA is to make sure that like the app level always has availability. So um, we like, showing in the best practices, like how that translates into a world of I'm someone who's actually providing the container and Kubernetes infrastructure and I'm less concerned with the application layer. Um, that's like, hey, these three containers died and then rescheduled over on these servers, that's okay because you never had any outages for like the in service that you're providing. Like, um, I know that that's probably like a duh comment for most of the people on this call, but you know, a lot of the legacy network server world, you know, it's not like something that just like pops right into their head of like, cause they maybe not be looking at the service layer. They're looking at a bunch of, you know, Kibana dashboards that just showed a bunch of containers got torn down and redeployed over here. And like their stomach drops out for a moment. So anyways, I'm gonna shut up for a bit cause you guys all know how to read um, and just continue to let the rest of the group uh, guide the discussion on kind of what we would want to do as far as like identifying some of the challenges we have right now, um, 
I even think that it would be a good idea to like mark things of like, this is a challenge the telco user group sees in general. And we think that maybe this is something the CNF working group or the CNF testbed might help us solve. And we could even identify some of those things here and then leverage the other groups um, to help us with them. Yeah, I wanna um, circle back a little bit. Um, the reason why we reached out to uh, Jeffrey on this was we keep having discussions or, around what is the motivations and um, what are what are some of the um, whys that either whether it's an operator or actual doing operations, whether that's a service provider, internal team, ops team, or um, that's a, a, a group that's working with a service provider and providing those services, where you're looking at um, from the CNF developer side and how to consume the resources or how to actually create the the internals so there's it's always comes back to what are the drivers and um and we either get very very high level um that doesn't apply enough within what we're trying to move towards as far as like the cloud native type of thinking like what's our reason here or it's very specific. So the, the idea was to try to get something, uh, hopefully a white paper that addressed those whys and um, maybe list some requirements. So some of the things that was discussed right now was items that maybe they don't work on a cloud provider and the cloud provider actually doesn't wanna support it. And the reason why they're doing it is maybe because they think designing um, the the application, I'm going to say that what's actually running, not the specific, maybe not even the specific network functions or anything else, but maybe they're trying to communicate that the entire design should be different. Maybe not. Maybe they just don't have the support. But if we can come up with a list of things that are those underlying needs, like what the driver's section of what this document has, and then some of the specific current requirements, we could start mapping them out as Jeffrey was saying there at the last. Is this something that we're even ready for within one of the current groups? Like, is, is this something from an applications perspective we can talk about in the CNF working group and say, here's a best practice already for, that'll help with uh, third-party integration. How, how can you do that? Um, what best practices help with that? It's probably not one, it's probably many things. But if we have this, then it could be applied wherever. It's probably a document that would be useful in um, other groups. Like I could see it for Anakit within the RA2 efforts. It, it would be a supplement. There's already been work there, but this would be more content for that or maybe the CNF testbed of Jeffrey, as Jeffrey pointed out. So that's a whole tool set for trying to um, experiment with various uh, cloud native and Kubernetes um, technologies running on a, a, a base Kubernetes, um, vanilla Kubernetes that you could deploy currently to Equinix Metal was um, previously packet. But the idea there is take whatever out of this paper if we if we work through it and we could use it in many different sources um, that also allows us within those groups wherever that is to be more focused so if we say right now we don't have something um, in the cnf working group we don't have a best practice that covers this topic so now we should probably reach out and say someone needs to go and start talking with whatever groups that may be Kubernetes uh, network plumbing group, it could be SIG networking, SIG app delivery, whatever it is, to start talking and bringing up these items, these concerns that which where we find gaps and they go, oh, we need to start addressing that. Or maybe they bring up something that we didn't think about. But that's the, the idea. Make this a useful set of um, the challenges, the drivers, all the why behind it that we can use in all the other groups. Um, Taylor and Jeff, my name is Ike Allison. Um, I just would like to share one thing with you. 
with both of you first. I mean, I have a presentation that may provide you with a little bit with an insight about 5G, a little bit about the core, and then and how you actually add alternative virtualized technologies on applications and how this is handling the environment of these alternative virtualized technologies without actually going to mano. Uh, maybe the cloud native computing foundation technologies is actually very much related to 5G uh, slicing because it, when you start looking in the uh, slice, you know, sub instance, then it's very much you know connected to the set of network functions and necessary resources and then the computer storage and networking is added plus with the 5g you know terminal you have support to eight udp sessions which is actually simultaneous support to eight slices um Maybe I will share with both of you first a link to a presentation. And if you find it that it might be useful, that it is providing some kind of an insight about the telco side of 5G, and then elaborating, OK, how can you actually, on top of that, you can add the cloud native computing technologies. It's not actually elaborating on the network data layer in which the network functions applications where the context of the application data is separated from the business logic and it is stored as a structured and unstructured data. And when the network functions actually are providing services that can be both consumed and produced at the same time. Um, and maybe then you can get a little bit a whole picture. I mean, for instance, if you look in Germany, a year ago, the 5G license had been issued. And now within one year, there had been an application for 88 private 5G licenses. The question is why? But you see, I, I, I will drop you a mail to both of you with a link to a presentation. If you find it to be useful about the telco and a little bit, you know, the connection to cloud native computing technologies, maybe, you know, uh, we, we can, we can, uh, I can present it, or if not, you know, we continue with the work. Can you share the presentation with the rest of the group also, please? Uh, yeah. yeah, I would be happy for you to drop the link right into, um, you can drop it right into the meeting notes. You mean in the chat? Uh, you can drop it in there or the uh, Google Doc meeting notes. I'll um, drop that into the Zoom chat as well. But if you put the link to the presentation, then I'll put it in the the Should public I mean, meeting notes. I, I will try now right away because it is on the slide share actually under my name. Sorry for this, guys. And I do. I think it would be great if you um, want to talk more about that, or we'll just say within the Telco Music Group, talking about the relationship between 5G and cloud native. Um, what I'd say is, um, and you can go read about this. It's it's mentioned many times in different articles and stuff. 5G has adopted many of the methodologies that you see in cloud native, and cloud native, of course is a aggregation of many different principles and methodologies. So if, whenever 5G was created, it wasn't siloed, the thinking it was going out and saying, what is what are all the industries doing and then what can we do to move from where we are to the next version of this? And so 5G actually encompasses many of those things. Of course, uh, go ahead. No, you're absolutely right, because in this presentation, the link that I sent to you now in the chat, it starts with 2015 NGMN paper, and in it, 112 pages, I think, or 113, there is 55 references to the edge when it comes to the cloud edge or to the cell center and the cell edge. But then in 2017, as 3GPP start developing to release 15, 
And then in March, the Etsy Mac renamed mobile edge computing to multi-axis edge computing in I think it was in March, early March. And if you look in February, just the month, the month before that, 3GPP actually made three revisions of release 15, and they made some changes when it comes to the mobility. They made some changes when it comes to support for the multi-axis radio access technology. Suddenly, it's not anymore only the 3GPP radio. It's also Wi-Fi. Ethernet, you know, Bluetooth, they actually provide some definition about this multi wrap technologies availability and reliability. And when you start looking on top of that, actually, how they enhance the 5G when it comes to something that is called, you know, local traffic, routing and service steering, then suddenly you may get this idea that the problems with whatever they defined with Edge in 2015, it is actually resolved in 2018 and 2019 through some enhancements in the capabilities, not functions and features, but a group of functions and features that provide capabilities, for instance, you have a support of the five core network that you actually select certain functions and features and move them to a so-called service area and define it as a tracking area and provide service in this. And you can define not so more, not any longer the throughput, but it is about latency. Suddenly the customer user experience is not anymore defined only with the throughput as it was with 3G, 3.5 and, and 4G. It is now a combination between mobility, latency and throughput. These are the three actually variables that define the customer user experience. And mobility is not anymore only your terminal, your cell phone. Now you have four different types of mobility. You have units that are stationary during the entire life. You have nomadic, you can move them, but they're stationary when they're active. You have units that are within a constrained area. Think about self-driving cars that actually have a predefined route. And they're going only through this. And if you look at Germany, Mercedes, Bosch, BMW, Volkswagen. They are getting private 5G licenses. And then you have the fourth group of mobility, which is your cellular phone. I and think, then on um, I think sorry. that this um, would be a good follow-up um, discussion. Um, we have 10 minutes. I want to make sure that we have enough time for anybody's feedback. I do think that I would probably include um, from if, if we're going to take this from a what is the telecom user group. So the cloud native computing foundation telecom user group. What are we trying to do. And I would take that perspective for how to pull in 5G um, and what I would look at is this would be related to transitioning. So how are you going to transition any brownfield to start taking on anything, any new best practices, any new technology? So there's some people that would want to embed it within there. That's fine. So the, some people would say, here's what we have, but we want to move to something else. Either way, it's a transition. So you're trying to map the terminology and understanding between these. And this seems related to what Jeffrey was doing with regard to telco challenges and drivers, but a very, maybe a specific one. So we probably could even have a new white paper that's just focused on how do you relate 5G, what's currently happening with regards to any type of, whether you say Kubernetes native, like going towards something that's more Kubernetes native, or cloud native in general, how, how do these fit together? That could probably be a white paper in and of itself. 
but it, it's at least a bullet point within um, what Jeffrey was talking about, challenges. So you say a current service provider is already deploying 5G um, technologies and a 5G network and starting to utilize these in various places. So how do they do that while looking at potentially new, maybe even conflicting processes, methodologies, as well as technology? How do they merge those together? I think that would be a challenge um, that would be listed within um, the white paper that Jeffrey was putting forward and then maybe a, a more extensive. But I'd be happy to hear more. Um, I can, I'm, I'm sure that um, other people would like to discuss this more in a, in a future meeting. But does anyone have any um, comment? I wanna, we have nine minutes before this uh, meeting ends. Does anyone have any questions or comments or on either what Jeffrey or Eck was talking about? Uh, maybe just a, a quick comment. Um, it was very interesting. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, my, I guess my quick comment was uh, you, you made a, a reference about APIs being very, very large in Kubernetes, very sprawling. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure that's the problem or if I agree, or if it is a problem, I think there is a misunderstanding of uh, what APIs actually do in Kubernetes that, that we need to change. Uh, one of the things that Kubernetes one does- One quick thing, Cal, just because I don't want you to go down like the line. I'm saying like, despite the fact that it's big, um, it's manageable and all of us have figured out how to consume it. I was saying in the NFE space, um, there's lots of weird like siloed and vertical APIs that you know look for very niche things, um, require a lot of finite knowledge of what the end deployment's going to look like. Uh, it's in one of the um, like the drivers is getting to declarative deployments. Like so, yeah, it's it's actually the opposite of that I'm saying like despite the fact that the API is you know very like large and all encompassing, um, in my opinion, it's pretty consumable from a Kate side where in previous NFV stacks, um, you know, like some people are using Swagger, other people are using homegrown APIs. Like it's just kind of all over the place. Um, you as the individual consumer better know in granular detail what's going in that NSD. Um, you know, the, just the layer of abstraction that Kate Springs through its APIs, I feel like is one of the reasons why it's been so successful. Um, and so I was like actually saying we should just figure out how we continue to emulate that and avoid some of the like traps we got into in the previous iteration with NFE. Sure, yeah, I, I, we're definitely on the same page here. I'm, I think what I'm trying to fine tune is, is the language to use because the way I see it, it's uh, the paradigm has shifted from talking about APIs to a scheduling paradigm, which is a declarative. And, uh, Maybe that's what you mean, right? If you look at kind of, uh, I, th I think even in the Kubernetes documentation, it is called APIs, but they're not really APIs, they're data structures, right? That eventually mostly are used, uh, expressed as YAML manifests. Of course, behind the scenes, it's, uh, you know, Go creates these resources on the API so, uh, service. Uh, but, but I think that's the shift, right? If you compare, for example, Kubernetes to OpenStack, Right, in OpenStack, you do have APIs for the various services. If it's Nova, if it's uh, Neutron, uh, all these services have their own APIs that are documented. But in Kubernetes, that's not the important part. Kubernetes is itself extensible. The API server is actually fairly simple. <laughs> um, in the end, it's it's those resources and those uh, data structures. So it's it's a shift in language, but it could be important because. In, in some of the groups that I'm working on, if you look at uh, the work being done in ORAN and other groups, there's a lot of people bring up this issue of, yes, we need to specify the APIs uh, because we deal with open APIs. What I'm trying to do is shift the conversation to what I call open models instead of open APIs. APIs have become less important in the Kubernetes world, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Anyway, it's, it's just a little comment, hopefully supplementary and helpful. <laughs> uh, sorry, Tao, you, uh, you're actually very, very right because we have a shift actually from process centric 
to data centric. I mean, if you start looking how you will utilize machine learning through closed loop automation, and you actually connect different architecture because you have GANA, Etsy's GANA, you know, generic autonomic network architecture, also with Etsy Any, experiential network intelligence. Once you have in the applications, the context data related that is separated from the business logic data of the applications, then whatever you actually underline to is, you know, strategically important. Particularly, you know, when on top you have the cloud native and this is, you know, the agnostic communication between different architecture, but not based on processes, but on the data structure, the data characteristics, the data granularity. Yeah, I, and I you think, have a net oh, sorry. And then you have a network that is actually divided into sub networks to sub networks. And then you that's very much that is steering the data because we are going to be in everything self driving cars, all the units, the sensors, and we are going to be continuously generating data. I, I agree entirely. And um, of course, <laughs> And I'll, I'll also point out that this change has been going on for a while, the move to data. For example, uh, Yang. Uh, Yang models are the interesting part, not the, uh, the NetConf APIs, right? Or if it's RESTConf, that kind of decision is not the important one. The important one is the Yang models. And Tosca too, to an extent, the inroads that it make in is a way of modeling our, our resources in the various clouds and the various layers. So Kubernetes, I think, fits in very well in this move uh, uh, into this data paradigm. So anyway, it's, it's, it may be exploding a little bit on a com Jeff, <laughs> a comment that you made, but it's uh, hopefully it's a supplemental. No, it, it's good. So one of the things that I struggle with is like, what is and isn't in scope. So here's the thing, right? Like um, what you're talking about, Tal, me and a couple other developers in our company, we've been pushing really hard on the concept of open config standardized Yang models with our own little translation in between to get rid of that tool sprawl. So we write our own common data structures at the top. Um, we do it mostly in Yang with some other modeling languages as well. And then we push down the corresponding payloads. Um, I think the like kind of hand waving the APIs away, like, like you said, Yang and how you structure and build services is way more interesting than NetConf itself. But at the same time, without like the transactional nature um, and like the interface that's provided for you, like you still have to have something that can consume those data structures. Like not every tool is capable of consuming a data structure the way that you would want to push it. So like, I don't know if I fully agree that like, you know, the APIs have become that trivial. Um, I do agree though that like, the standardization should be focused on how we structure the data and how we present things, getting away from like, you know, scripted automation towards here's standardized models that like have well-defined, you know, values and fields, et cetera. But I just, I mean, I, I've pushed Yang into things that do things very poorly that don't have the concept of a transaction. Um, and like, if you don't have that, then you get into these issues where like I model how I want BGP to look, but there's a lot of CLIs in a lot of different, you know, um, network operator platforms that like, it does not accept transactional configuration in that manner. Like you have to go in and turn BGP on as a process before you can then configure BGP. So doing that, you know, in a data model without the interface of the API or the um, scheduler, all of the necessary componentry involved means that my data model falls on its face. No, you're, you're very right. But I'll point out that, you know, if the, the topic is Kubernetes, right? And in Kubernetes, if you implement that using a Kubernetes operator, you turn it into a difficult protocol transactional challenge into something that the operator would do the heavy lifting for, and you just declare a custom resource in, in Kubernetes, that would take care of it, right? At least that's, Jeff, a, that's sorry. Right. Yeah, isn't, isn't it our uh, goal uh, to be, uh, this is our to be state where you don't have the transactional model anymore? I think all of these are discussions that I'm hoping we solve in these two groups. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. we're at the top of the call. Um, and thanks everybody for the discussion. We're gonna switch over to the CNF working group for anyone that wants to join us there. 
and I'll, I'm going to drop the link for the meeting notes and the chat if you don't have it. See you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.